realness. We need yes. it so bad. <laughs> Absolutely. So we've got a great class. We've got a great group of folks today. Um, my name is Ali Dupu. I've got Joshua Liz Lisbon and Maggie. Okay, is it her shower? Did I say that correct? Perfect. Yes. Um, to talk to everybody about mountain lions today. And I want to just go over sort of the way that this, this is going to run. Um, we're going to talk a lot about the study that MPG Ranch and Joshua Lisbon is in charge of. I'm actually going to mute you guys for just a second so it's we can hear each other and then unmute me when you have questions. Um, let's see, who am I missing here? Somebody. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to start off with a little bit of an intro to everything that's going on. Okay. Someone's got their microphone unmuted. And I'm wondering if you can go ahead and mute that. There we go. Perfect. Okay. So we're going to start get we're going to start with what's happening in the study. We're going to learn a little bit about what they're hoping to learn in this study. Then we're going to go through some actual data that uh, has been collected over the last few years. And we're going to walk through it as though we were Joshua and Maggie out there in the field. Um, they're going to analyze a photo for you. And then we're going to turn it over to you. And you'll get a chance to analyze um, a photo and also a video. Um, after that, we are going to just talk a little bit more about a few things they've learned. Um, and then we'll have a big reveal as to the new information that just came back from the lab will pop into breakout rooms so that students that are a little bit younger can ask some questions with maggie and students that are a little bit older can chat with joshua awesome so without further ado i'm going to go ahead and do a little screen sharing um so you can sort of see what's happening okay we'll put this on there and head up. And Joshua, I am going to turn it over to you. Oh, man. Well, welcome, everybody. Uh, you're going to get a few lovely photos to start it off here. Uh, this is MPG Ranch. You're going to see it through some different seasons. It does not look like that right now, but it will in just a few months. <laughs> and um, I mean, it's an absolutely incredible place. And so if you are not familiar with us, we are located in the Bitterroot Valley. We're just south of Missoula in Western Montana, and we are on the east side of the Bitterroot River. So we're in the Sapphire Mountains and our views are of the jagged Bitterroot Mountains. We are over 15,000 acres and MPG is a private conservation organization. Uh, and we are managing this land to basically determine best practices for land restoration practices. Um, and we make all of that publicly available and so to that end, we're studying the entire matrix of life on the ranch. So everything from the soil microbes through the plants and the trees and the shrubs up through the pollinators and the monarch butterflies that Maggie knows a lot about and um, lots of bird research, lots of bears and mountain lions, which is another part of the puzzle. And so that's what we're studying right now. We have about two weeks left in our study se uh, season. And so we're very grateful for the snow that came because it's been an abnormally warm winter and it makes tracking really hard um, because mountain lions having soft little feet, they don't leave a lot of evidence behind in the woods. And so it's a lot easier to track them in the winter. I love it. Okay, so Joshua, tell us just a little bit about this study. Um, when did it start, just for out of curiosity? Uh, we started in the winter of 2012, 2013. And so kind of the annoying thing about talking about our study is it happens in the winter and it starts in December and it goes through to February, the end of February. So we're always split years. So it started December 2012, ran into uh, late winter uh, into 2013. So that was our first year. We were really just setting up the protocols and how it began was um, Philip, who's the ranch manager and my boss, uh, he read the research of uh, Dr. Mike Sawaya of Sonopa Industries, and Dr. Sawaya had pioneered non-invasive protocols for sampling, which means most studies are short-term 
and they're going out and they're collaring a lot of cats. So they'll employ houndsmen and houndswomen. They'll tree, dart, collar cats, turn them loose, and then you've got the GPS data off of that individual. You can also collect samples while you have the cat in hand. Um, it's a little bit more intensive on uh, on disturbance because you are definitely engaging directly with uh, your study subjects. So we wanted to go a different way. So uh, Dr. Swaya pioneered these non-invasive protocols. We like that, and so that's what we're doing, which means we are following cats in the snow the opposite direction that they're going. So we, we'll talk about backtracking a lot, which just means we're going the opposite way they are in the hopes of not encountering them and not disturbing them. And, um, and then we pick up hair and we pick up scat opportunistically along the way. Sometimes it's deposited along the trail. Hair is often, you know, best from a bed site. Scat at kill sites is great because mountain lions have latrines and you can mine those latrines for, for DNA. And from that, we run it through the genomics laboratory on the university campus here in town. And they get us the information back that uh, tells us our individuals. So how many cats we have individually identified that winter, whether they are residents or transients. And that is determined really over the course of multiple years, because it's challenging to know with just one year's data set, uh, whether those cats actually live there or not. So that's going to be a trend. We got to follow them for years to figure out who actually lives there. And then we can figure out relatedness. So if, if the moms are having kittens and, you know, those kittens are growing up, but they're staying in their natal range and running around, uh, we can figure out who's related to who and how those sort of like mountain lion dynasties play out on the ranch, because we've definitely had some, some shifts there in the past couple of years. And we're, we're tracking that change right now. Oh my gosh. Okay. So there's something that's a little bit exciting and I'm going to stop sharing my camera for just a second and I'll start it again. Um, through this process, you've been working on something else. Do you want to share oh. what that is? Oh man. <clears throat> yeah. So through, so something about MPG that is also very unique um, is that we have an extensive camera network. This is so important for our study and so important for a lot of what's going on at the ranch because we have um, cameras that you can access. So you can go on our website, you can bring up the live cameras, you can move them around, zoom in and out, see what's going on. We have what we call our Buckeye cameras. And so you can bring up that feed on our website and just look at all the animal pictures and who's walking by where. And those are in pretty strategic places, but we also have a trail camera network. So like the little Browning trail cams, and they are all over the place at wildlife corridors and water holes and important places. And so we can monitor land movement or, or movement of animals through the landscape year by year for years. So these, these cameras have been out there for about a decade now. And we put cameras on kill sites, which gets us a lot of imagery and information about individuals and cats and their behaviors. But we also get this other camera network data. And so we have a lot of recordings of cats doing amazing things that we catch on these cameras. And what we've been realizing over the years as we track individuals is that some of those individuals have a very compelling story. And we put all of that together and we made a film. And it took about three years to put it all together because mountain lions are very non-cooperative and they're very difficult to film. Um, so most of the things you've probably seen about mountain lions are either scary TikTok videos or, um, or you know, they filmed them in South America in preserves because the, the South American mountain lions are much easier to get close to and film. North American mountain lions are very difficult to film. So it took us a long time, but we put it all together and we were accepted into the Big Sky Documentary Film Festival and it will premiere in just a couple of weeks there. And so we have a trailer to share with you. And so if this is something that you're interested in. If you live locally, come see the show. Colin and I are gonna be there. Colin's a filmmaker. We'll do Q and A afterwards. If you don't live locally, you can stream it. Uh, it's gonna be at the Wilma Theater, the 27th of February for, at 1230 in the afternoon for the live show. And then you can stream it the 28th, which is that Monday through Thursday, March 3rd. You just buy a ticket and you can watch it. So if you want to watch it with your class or you just want to watch it or whatever, um, please check it out. It took us a long time and we're really proud of it. Well, and another cool thing I think to think about is how many of you, and I'm just like thumbs up, thumbs down, have ever played with one of the trail cameras? 
I have one at my house that I like to see. I always like to put it up just to see what critters, especially in the fall, are coming around. Because um, I live in sort of a wildlife city interface. And so it's fun to think about how we can use this data, whether it's in the realm of science, whether it's in the realm of storytelling, or mixing all of those together. So I'm going to go ahead and share the trailer, and we will be right Spoiler, back. I have long hair. <laughs> All right, here we go. There is a story there in the snow. This family group is where the story begins. Tracking notes, February 5th, 2016. Right when I hit the bottom of Davis Creek, I found a cougar track. We have hundreds of cameras on the landscape that have been collecting imagery for 10 years. And because of this, we are able to get this really intimate glimpse into how animals use the landscape. It's always been amazing to me that mountain lions not only are capable of killing elk, but that they do so regularly. Ultimately, all of these animals are inhabiting the same landscape and they encounter each other frequently. Conventional wisdom is that cats are very solitary and they won't share their food resources and they're incredibly territorial. It's becoming increasingly clear that mountain lions have a more robust social structure than we would typically want to give them credit for. My goodness, I cannot wait to see the movie. <laughs> that's awesome. That is really cool, Joshua. Congratulations on that. And that's a really good way just to like kick off the study that we've been talking about um, and learning a little bit about more about it. So uh, we are going to have time at the end for Q&A, but if you do have a question in the middle, go ahead and type that in the chat um, and we'll try to address it as we're going as we're going through through. So I'm going to go ahead and keep us keep us rolling because we have a lot of really fun stuff to get through. All right, coming back. We've got the PowerPoint coming back up, guys. I'm sure you're all very familiar with this technique at this moment. So Joshua, tell us a little bit more about the protocols and um, what you're, you know, what the process looks like when you're out there. And Maggie, yeah. you can chime in too. Yeah, I guess I'll I'll run over just kind of like how all these pieces fit together. And then Maggie, if I can hand it off to you, you want to do like a day in the life? Yeah, that sounds good. Cool. So we've got um, kind of a few pieces here, right? So there's the tracking, there's the cameras, there's the lab analysis, and then like the documentation and field notes and all that stuff. So our study, because it's non-invasive, there are certain questions that we're not going to be able to answer. So like, we're not going to get a full picture of home ranges and where these cats are exactly at any time. We are studying them in the winter. So their food resources, which are going to be their deer and the elk and everything else, it's all crunched down into winter range. So the cats are crunched down in the winter range too. So think they're not moving around quite as much. Um, so we are looking at them at a specific time of year. The tracking part of it, we are in the field, we are seeing the, the tracks, we can piece together what's going on behaviorally, we can see if it's a mother plus kittens, how many kittens, we can, um, you know, see if, is it a Tom, it's like being, that's a, a male cat, usually a territorial male. And so we can suss some of this stuff out in the field just by the tracks. Then we have the cameras. So if we get a kill site, we put cameras up. We've got these other camera networks as well that are catching cats. 
And so if we're tracking and we, you know, don't know, we don't see all the kittens or, you know, something, we don't catch something on a kill site. Often we get all of that. So like we will find mom has actually, you know, three kittens. We thought it was two or, you know, sometimes the lab analysis too, we pick up all the DNA from somewhere and we can get some of the kittens related to mom, but we don't get all of them um, because the DNA just isn't good enough. But those cameras fill in that gap or the tracking fills in that gap. And so these three pieces put together really help us to get a clear picture of what's going on, where any one of them alone would, would the puzzle would be really pretty vague. Uh, and we never get all the pieces of the puzzle. Like I always want to know more. The lab data is like, I, when I get those emails, it's like Christmas, you know, it's like those reports come in and I am like, I'm so excited to open those reports and see who we found and, you know, whose stories are still playing out uh, in our study area. And I never get enough. So I, you know, and then it really makes me want to just like go back out and, and track more. So I would just want to gather more hair samples, <laughs> you know, but, um, and then there's the documentation, right? So every day at the end of our day, we're writing these detailed field notes that tell everybody what's going on. It fills in the story of our day, the conditions we saw, whether we found tracks, all that stuff. That is also super important because if I need to go back and look, so I get genetic data from a kill site. We thought it was a couple of individuals. We find out they're not related. Now that's exciting. You know, that's, that's cool stuff. So we want to go back. I can look at the field notes from that day. I can read what the tracker saw. And then that informs me about what took place at that site. And then I have a better understanding of what's going on. So there's all these little pieces of the puzzle working together. I love it. So I'm wondering, Maggie, as you go through like a day in the life of a tracker, um, I'm thinking about putting on a <laughs> a lovely, gory, <laughs> I'm seeing some reactions there in the glasses, <laughs> image for you. I took this picture and I tell you what, it smelled good too. <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> So let's pretend, Maggie, that you ha like you're right here and you've just come across this. So why don't you kind of go through day in the life? I know Maggie was having a little bit of trouble with. Yeah, with sorry. So yeah, <laughs> that's OK. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I um, I hope you guys can hear me uh, shout or something if, if something goes wrong. But yeah, so the day starts with um, we have about seven, eight, nine access points across the entire ranch. And so um, we drive, we park, we get out of our cars and strap on our snowshoes or um, our micro spikes, which are like these crampon cleats onto our feet. And we head up the mountain and um, pretty much pick your own adventure. And we hike until we cut cat tracks. When we do that, we have these GPS units with us. And um, the whole time we're tracking ourselves with the GPS unit. But along the way, if we find a cat track, we leave a waypoint for where the track starts. And we typically start by going the opposite direction of travel as the cat. And that's so that especially if it's a very fresh track, if the cat's been there recently, we don't want to push them or move them from their bed site. Um, so we'll track them in the opposite direction. And um, if we're lucky enough, we come across exciting things like this kill site. Um, but the whole time we're collecting, um, if we find scat samples or sometimes if they cross under a barbed wire fence or if they walk through some sagebrush or um, through some dense trees, we can collect some hair samples that have snagged and um, we go wherever they go. So they can take you into some pretty gnarly um, dense brush or down into a ravine or up onto a ridge and you just have to hike and go, go where they go. And um, so we follow them until we either hit a private property boundary, which there aren't too many of in the, in the area, or um, if we lose them, like lately, the snow conditions have been so poor that we're losing tracks on bare ground because it's been so warm. Um, the other day I tracked a track that was like the size of a dinner plate because it was so melted out from the sun and the heat. So the tracks change over time. It can sometimes be challenging, but um, we get miles of tracks if possible, then DNA. And um, at the end of the day, hopefully we track until dark, you know, or just before dark, we get back to our cars. And then there's a, 
about an hour worth of computer work where we write up a report and we look at the map and we string together the mountain lion path. And um, we share that with all of the trackers via email so that everybody knows what was found for the day. And we can follow up if we need to, to make even longer tracks of, of an individual track. And awesome. like, for instance, the kill site that you see, we can go back to that. And um, if we can place a camera on it, or we can go back to it in a week and, and try to find the latrine and get DNA. So the emails and staying in communication is really important. Awesome. So I want to ask Maggie and Joshua a couple of questions, and then we are going to put up a new kill site picture and you are going to be asked the exact same questions and you'll have an opportunity to turn and talk in your class and then report back out. So Joshua and Maggie, you've come to this kill site. Um, what do you know? Like, what are your observations when you are looking at, at this scene? Go for it, Maggie. I'll follow well, up on you. I'm noticing. Yeah, well, I'm noticing that it's it's kind of out in the open, but it's it's kind of been tucked under a bush. So I'm kind of looking at the terrain and, and what's around. Um, there's obviously, you know, a lot of the organs are missing and most of the the center part of the of the body is is been eaten, but the, the stomach is still there. Um, a lot of birds I think have been around. I see some, some bird poop on the legs. Um, yeah, Joshua, what do you notice? Yeah, I think similar clues, right? So if you roll up on a site like this, it's clearly been fed on. Uh, it's clearly been found by scavengers already. The fact that the rumen or that stomach is intact is a good clue of who's been visiting. Mountain lions will start by eating the, the harder organs on the inside. So like liver, kidneys, lungs, heart, all that business, they tend to start there. So you've got some ribs that have been gnawed away to allow greater access. And so that stuff's gone. The top rear quarter looks like it's been eaten. So it's definitely been fed on. And this was one of those sites from, I think it's like a couple winters ago. Um, like we set up cameras on this. There's definitely mountain lions here because there were tracks present at the site. So, um, but we also know that like coyotes had started to come in as well. Fox had started to come in as well. And so this, I think is, you know, mountain lion kill sites tend to be really neat and tidy. So like everything stays kind of contained like this, but this out in the open business, they don't like that very much. So this is a, an elk, elk are very heavy. They're hard to move when they're intact. Um, if this thing tipped off the edge, which eventually it did, it's going to go straight down into a ravine. Uh, and that's ultimately what happened with this, with this animal it got drug off of this road grade. Um, but it's kind of an awkward place for anything to want to feed. So it was like the, the animals were coming in at night. Um, but then from this, what I would do is I'd start looking for beds, looking for latrines, stuff nearby so that I can get some DNA. Awesome. That's wonderful. So um, how would you use this information in your research? You want to jump in, Maggie? I think Maggie's having a little bit of slow internet. Okay, I'll 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 chime in. So the um uh, the the DNA information is going to be super important for us. So the hair from bed sites, the scat from latrines, that's going to help us peg individuals. Um, so we're going to look for as much of that as we can. Um, this there's like nothing around to cache this kill, which I think was probably really frustrating for the cats because. They want to cover over a kill and because they weren't able to, the scavenger birds got on this thing really quick. Um, but yeah, really we're looking for DNA. And then if possible, we're going to set up cameras and try to get imagery to match that DNA uh, to the imagery. And we, we tried that for this site, but we set up a lot of big fancy cameras and it kind of freaked everything out. So <laughs> <they> were, <laughs> it was such a great shot, but um, you will actually see this elk in the film, um, but it, it wow. features mostly magpies. <laughs> I love it. Okay, so it's now time for you guys to have an opportunity to like look at a kill site, more more kill sites early in the morning. Um, I've got this one for you. So I want you to take about 30 seconds um, in your class, turn and talk and make some observations. What do you 
what do you observe about this kill site? Um, similar to the way that Joshua and Maggie just went through that process with the other image. So go ahead, take about 30 seconds, talk, and then um, I think we'll just use the chat, the chat box right now. Go ahead and type in those observations in the chat and we'll read those out. You're also welcome to unmute your microphone too, if that's easier, because I know sometimes the computers are at an awkward, an awkward spot. All right, we've got one that says, this guy's been draped over a tree. So that's one observation. No organs. Yep. So that was in line with what Joshua was saying about what goes what goes first. Oh, it's kind of buried in the snow, so it's been there a while. Um, Mr. Kujal's class says it's an older kill been eaten. Yeah. Yeah, that guy looks like he's in pretty rough shape. All right, I'll give you guys a few more a few more seconds. Um, go ahead, type that in or unmute your microphone and let us know. All right, Joshua, Maggie, you want to add anything to this one? Oh, wait, we have one more. Mrs. Suelo's class says the ribs have been eaten or broken, so the organs were more exposed. The harder organs were also eaten. Good observation. Yeah, it sounds like people are really cluing in. Uh, I'd say there's like some whitewash on this guy again, so you can see some bird poo. You know, the scavenger birds have been there. Uh, this kill's pretty played out at this point. There's not a lot left for uh, a mountain lion to want to come back to this. So I, I took this picture when I came back to take the camera down. Um, but yeah, you can see the ribs have been gnawed into to open up that cavity so that it provides access to those organs, which is usually where they start. And the hide has been pulled back. You can see how it's been removed to allow access again. Uh, that leg in the back looks like probably the freshest thing on there. And so this is pretty well consumed at this point. But um, yeah, it's definitely definitely fed on by by a mountain lion and we have uh we have imagery of of the individual eating this elk i think what's well, is that kind of is, is this maybe that imagery that we we're talking about no nope, this, this is actually one? another wow. kill so this we know who this cat is and and this is a, a cow elk on on a different part of the ranch um but this is yeah this is like what you see you know so when we pull those cameras we go in all all hopeful and expectant, and if we get something like this, it's it's awesome. So we're very excited about it, and we're always sending videos and screen grabs to each other. Okay, so here's a question that I have for you: um, How do you use an image of a like? How I mean, it, it is very cool to see a mountain lion eating the elk and to ca capture that. But how do you use that in your research? How, because, how does that help you? Yeah, so this they've got really short digestive tracts. So whatever goes in is going to come out pretty quick. So they okay. uh, they establish a lot of latrine sites, which basically mountain lions they're they are super OCD. So they will like poop in a spot and cover it and poop and cover it and poop and cover it. And you end up with this like mound of pine needles or whatever's around, sometimes just snow. And it's full of mountain lion poop. And so you can get in there and get really good DNA. They also bed nearby, so you can pull hair out of the beds. So the kill sites are fantastic for us for genetics. And then the imagery allows us to know, like, were there multiple individuals? Oh, the cats that we're seeing on there looks like maybe there's two, but we can't quite tell. And then the genetics gives it away and lets us know if, if we have unrelated individuals or distantly related individuals or, or whatever's going on. 
I love it. So we're going to do this one more time, but I'm going to do we're, we have a video. So this time um, you come across a kill site, you put your camera up, you wait, essentially, you may visit the kill site again, then you come back, take it down. And then that's when you're hoping to get some really interesting additional information. So I'm going to go ahead and share this video with you. Here we go. And go ahead and make some of those observations. You can think about those, put those in the chat. One of the things that stands out for me about these cats, and you'll you'll see through this if you're paying attention, there are there are two individuals here. So you're gonna see two different cats. Um, but look at their ears. Their ears are really short and stubby. These cats um, got hit with frostbite. And so because their ears have been affected, um, we can later identify them more easily because they now have a distinguishing feature that often they don't. And you'll see that like plucking off the hair, that's super common. Um, they don't want to eat hair, but they do. They eat a lot of it actually. So this is a juvenile, but look at his ears. They're so chopped down from frostbite. Mm -hmm. Mr. Scoochel's class is saying that this isn't, they're actively eating this one. So it must be a, like a fresher site, like a fresher kill. Yeah. And here you're seeing the, that caching behavior where they cover the kill over <clears throat> trying to hide it. And this little guy, because he's kind of new to all this, he's very experimental in his techniques. So he's like, yeah, we'll just throw some bark on there too. <laughs> <laughs> Is this the same cat that we first observed? Uh, nope, we haven't seen this guy yet. Okay. So we've got mom, mom, so here's, this is, might be mom coming in. We've got mom and a juvenile. And mom's like a more tawny kind of brown color. She's a little bigger and sleeker. And uh, the juvenile is uh, is smaller. So mom goes up the hill and then you get the juvenile popping up after. And stuff that also helps to give it away on, on like aging the cat because mountain lions are really tough to tell apart. So this juvenile... When you see him going for the tree, he's got these lines on the inside of his forelimb and that is gonna distinguish him as, as a younger cat. And they get those lines there and they stay for like two or three years. So you can kind of figure out how old this cat is because he doesn't have spots, he or she doesn't have spots, um, doesn't have like the faded dapples. Like once they're out of their kitten spots, they still have these kind of residual dapples, that's all gone. And it's like this cat's almost fully into adult coloration, but still has those lines on the arm and will for like two or three years. Oh my goodness. All right, uh, we're gonna pause this video. I'm gonna stop the share. Um, and I think what we need, kinda need to do, cause I wanna leave some time for question and answers at the end. Um, you've kind of walked us through a lot of what amazing stuff you guys are doing. There's one part that we haven't talked that much about, and it's the lab and the data that you that you get. And I hear that um, there is some new stuff. I'm going to actually share one slide with everybody, which is I'm going to cruise through here. Here's some of the study areas is this one. Um, and this is about what we know right now. Is this correct on who is related to whom the family tree of at the ranch? Is that right, Joshua? I'm sorry, are you showing a slide or no? Oh yeah, I'm sorry. Oops, let's, let's, let's try one more time. This guy right here. Yes, so this is, this is the family tree and F2, so she features prominently in the, in the movie we made because she's got a real Bambi story. Um, and then her first offspring, F9. So we named them for the for the purposes of the movie, because I mean, I know them really well by F9 or 
M20 or whatever. But if you're not familiar with that, it gets jumbled up real quick. So F2 became Willow, F9 became Sula. And you can see that F2 has had a lot of, a lot of offspring. And that bottom row, um, she ended up with six. So mountain lions will, uh, they'll, they'll adopt. And we think that's probably what happened is she adopted some kittens that were from, I'm guessing here, potentially F17, who's, who's part of a earlier litter, but she, however, she got them, she ended up with six and she raised them all to adulthood, which is like absolutely mind blowing that that's possible. And some of those kittens are still running around on the ranch right now. I love it. Okay. Um, I have one observation from Mr. Foucault's class today, and then I want to go with the big reveal. So those observations, two situations, they said on a scale of one to 10, they see fresh cat's tracks in the snow. Um, so how safe am I? Or do I see a fresh kill? So how safe am I? So it's kind of an interesting thing to look at in those, in those situations, right? So I think when you're, when you're tracking, like if you see that fresh, like those fresh tracks, do you turn around and go the opposite direction or do you, <laughs> do you follow them? What's your protocol? Our I can protocol take that is, one if, is to yeah, go the opposite go for it. Yeah. yeah. Well, so when we track, we always carry bear spray just as a precaution. Um, and if, so if we find tracks, we try to backtrack them mostly to not push the cats, but um, I've always felt very safe and um, they, they tend to run away. You know, they're secretive. They don't want, to have you around. Um, I've only seen a cat once and doing this for five years and um, it was running away from me. So I think in general, you are very safe. The likelihood of being attacked by a mountain lion is extremely small. Um, if you do see a fresh kill, I would say it's good to be aware of your surroundings, but I think um, you're not really a, a, in danger of um, being attacked by the mountain lion or anything like that. I think you're much more likely to have issues with grizzly bears um, at a kill site than certainly than mountain lions. I yeah. love it. So can I share, can I share a yeah, statistic go ahead. real quick? Go ahead. Yep. It's, it's one of my favorites and you are more likely to be killed by a vending machine statistically than you are by a mountain lion. So watch out for those vending machines. They'll get you. <laughs> All right. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to go ahead and I am going to, you're going to give us the big reveal. What data came back from the lab? Then I'm going to put you into breakout rooms so you can ask Joshua and Maggie questions in the chat. If you would just put in what grade um, you are in, then I will. It'll be a little bit easier for me to divide, divide and conquer. So Joshua, the big reveal. All right, we've got. So I think probably the coolest thing, what we ran into because cats are incredibly non-cooperative is that last winter, our mountain lions who are typically on a fall birth pulse decided to throw us a curveball and have their babies in the spring. So thank you, mama mountain lions. So this is what we are looking at from this winter. So the lab data has told us certain individuals from that family tree that we showed you are still alive and running around out there, which is awesome. Um, but we are in a moment of kind of shifting territories and new females moving in. And so we have at least this many family groups running around out there right now, which is crazy. So you can see one of them got one of them got marked off because we had a kitten get killed like a week ago. So that's kind of a bummer. But we have a mom plus three that are older running around in Davis Creek right now. And we've got a mom plus one. So that was who you just watched with the frostbite damage eating on that kill. We've got mom plus two who we filmed in June and who we've been tracking since then. And we think she's still got two, but we're not totally sure. And we just discovered mom plus three a few weeks ago. And then she just lost a kitten to a rather dramatic incident at a kill site. So she's down to two. And it's very possible there are actually more family groups out there than these. It seems like all of the females who could have babies have had babies. So we are going to, we have a lot of mysteries to solve this year with the genetics. So all of the samples that have come back in, the trackers are crushing it. Like they're just getting awesome DNA. And I've been sending stuff to the lab early because I just can't wait. So 
I hope that I'll have great updates for you real soon with that. Before we go into um, the breakout rooms, Mr. Fuqua's class says, I bet the person killed by a vending machine was trying to get a Kit Kat. Definitely, definitely. <laughs> nice one. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and open those rooms and we can just go ahead, unmute your microphones and ask questions. All right. All right, perfect. So am I responding to? Oh yeah, and then I'm gonna I'm actually going? put you with really good. I'm gonna, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, Maggie, I'm like, sending you room one. The text on the side? <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness, okay. So Maggie, go ahead and hop into room one if you would. Perfect, all right, <laughs> there we go. Am I in a room? You're in a room, you're here. Sweet, hi everybody. Well, I'm going to remove these spotlights. There we go. Now I can see everybody. Cool. Hey, everybody. All right. Go ahead and unmute your microphone. This is your opportunity to ask questions. <laughs> you can also type so them. Much, so much waving. Hello, everyone. <laughs> you can also type the questions. Okay, they're, they're unmuted. <laughs> Woo! Uh, Has anybody seen uh, Mount Lion before? I, I'm out hiking all the time. I've never seen one. Oh, it was good to see the other, those tracks for five years and only seen one. What if we wanted to common. see one? What's, what's, that's common to? Well, to not see them. I mean, they're, they're incredibly secretive. What if we want to see one? I mean, is there, uh, we're over here in Eastern Montana. I guess, what's the population like in Eastern Montana of mountain lions? Um, I know farmers get a few of them, but we try it. But uh, I've seen tracks myself. What's the what's the population like out here? Are they more ghostier than ghosts out here? Yeah, they're pretty ghosty everywhere. But you, I mean, you have a strong population in, in the, like there are species of least concern. And then in Montana, I forget what the population estimates are, but my guess is that they're those estimates are on the low side based on what we're seeing in the study area where we're at. Um, we have a pretty dense population. So in like any hundred square kilometers, a, a dense population would be more than four mountain lions, but I would hazard a guess that they actually exist at a denser population than that. Oh, I can't hear you. Like Makoshika Park, how many acres? How many? How many do you say per acres? Or oh, I guess uh, what's that? What's, what, what's the territory like of a one mountain lion? Do they have? Are they territorial? Is there a certain amount of acres per mountain lion? Or I guess that depends 